I am Peggy McPhillips, the president of Norfolk Historical Society, and I am so glad to welcome all of you to our program this evening. This is our, our July um, edition of the Lewis L. Guy History Series. We have a great program for you tonight on a Virginian that many people may not know very much about. He was from Petersburg, right nearby. His name was William Mahone. They called him Billy. They called him Little Billy because he wasn't very big, but he was described as short in stature, but every inch a soldier. Uh, he was a general in the Civil War. He was a, an entrepreneur in the railroad um, business in, North, in Virginia, and he was a state senator. So he really had his finger in a lot of pies. And we are going to try to correct the problem of not many people knowing about him tonight when Charlie Knight, our speaker, uh, presents his program on Little Billy Mahone, soldier, railroader, and readjuster. Charlie is a Virginian. He's a native of Richmond, and he developed a love of history at an early age. He's worked in historical venues for more than 20 years, uh, Newmarket Battlefield State Park. He was curator of Norfolk's MacArthur Memorial for several years, where some of you may have met him. Uh, you may also have attended the program that he did on the Battle of Newmarket. Uh, he also was the director of the Arizona Capitol Museum, and currently he is the curator of military history at the North Carolina Museum of History in Raleigh. He has written a couple of books, Valley Thunder, The Battle of Newmarket, From Arlington to Appomattox, which is um, Robert E. Lee's Civil War Day by Day, numerous magazine and journal articles. He was a historical advisor on the 2014 film Field of Lost Shoes about the Battle of Newmarket. He is currently working on a biography of William Mahone. He says he's up to 1863, so he's still working on that. Hopefully we can have him back after he finishes his book. And if we're in person and he can make the trip to Norfolk from Raleigh, we can have a book signing for you. Um, tonight, he will talk about Billy Mahone and I will turn it over to Charlie with no further ado. Charlie, it's yours. All righty, thank you, Peggy. And good evening, everybody. Uh, figures right when, right when Peggy started talking, the battery in my mouse died, so I had to replace that. Uh, so let's see, let me, let me, share my screen here, bear with me for a second. All right, that should be it. Hopefully everybody can see my screen here now. Oops, let me do that. All right, tonight I'm gonna to talk about a uh, fellow who's uh, has quite a bit of an impact on the city of Norfolk. He's probably uh, one of uh, Norfolk's more important uh, figures of the late 1850s, early 1860s period. He, he was quite important in the city's history, even though he was not, uh, not born there. And he, uh, he really becomes one of the, the biggest figures, if you will, in Virginia history in the, in the post-Civil War period but he's largely forgotten today. And there, there are several reasons for that. And I'll get into that a little bit later. And uh, talking about William Mahone, Little Billy, as he was known. And uh, he was, uh, was from Southeastern Virginia. We'll get into that here in just a second. But uh, Mahone, he's a fascinating figure. He really has really three different careers that overlap. He's a very, very, distinguished and gifted railroad man, uh, uh, civil engineer and, and railroader. Uh, he becomes a uh, uh, fantastic field commander in the Army of Northern Virginia during the Civil War. And then he really rises to political prominence after the war. And, and as I mentioned, really dominates Virginia politics for quite a while. And uh, so much so that Virginia's Dabney refers to the uh, uh, late 1870s and 1880s as the era of Billy Mahone. 
and uh, it's interesting for for such an important uh, historical figure. There's not really much that's ever been written about him. Uh, there's only been one biography of him, one full length biography of him that came out back in the 30s. A guy by the name of uh, Nelson Blake. He was a grad student at Duke at the time, and uh, it's a not a very easy to find book today. It's about, uh, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 pages. Um, but it, it doesn't deal with uh, Mahone the soldier. It deals primarily with Mahone the railroader. And uh, so he, uh, he covers the, uh, the Civil War period of Mahone's life in about 20 pages. Uh, so there's uh, a lot that uh, was not included in that biography, to say the least. And that's what I'm hoping to, uh, to address with my bio that will hopefully uh, be out in the uh, probably about two years, I would estimate. Um, but why is there so little that's ever been done about Mahone? Well, part of it is his handwriting. There's uh, thousands, literally thousands of his papers that are still around today. Duke, it's one of their largest collections, it's about 250 boxes plus another uh, 100 or so letter books. It's a huge collection. I've spent probably a month and a half all told going through it and have only made it through about 10 boxes. Uh, it's very slow going. And you can see part of the reason why they're on your screen. Uh, Mahone's handwriting really, really borders on the illegible. I, he, you know, could have been a doctor from uh, from that point of view, but uh, it's not not just a modern thing. You know, where modern historians can't read his writing, a lot of his contemporaries ran into the same uh, same issue with him. This was one of his political buddies that wrote to him in 1868. Uh, I doubt you understand modern English geography. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But that's the uh, uh, study of handwriting. And I don't understand Egyptian hieroglyphics in which you seem to prefer to communicate to your friends. And this letter that I've got up here, this, this was Mahone on a good day. Uh, uh, the, the later he got in life, the worse his handwriting got. There are quite a few letters at Duke that I just, I can't even begin to make any headway on trying to figure out what they say. Uh, the, the best formula I've come up with is try and pick out the words that you can and you know, fill in the rest by context clues. And uh, that leaves you with a pretty good idea of what he was trying to say. But um, part of the reason why nobody's ever tackled him is his handwriting. Um, and another is uh, he was a very polarizing figure uh, during his lifetime. Most folks either loved him or hated him. There really was not much middle ground. Uh, this was a, a fellow who, uh, who knew Mahone in the post-Civil War years. He was as vain, conceited, and egotistical a little chap as ever had anything to do with Virginia's affairs. At the end of the war, he had a very considerable military reputation, but some soldiers said it was a reputation made for him by the newspapers, and that's not entirely false. I hated him, and he is the only man that I ever hated. So obviously, you know, uh, uh, William Royal here was still kind of on the fence. You know, he hadn't really uh, made up his mind yet about, uh, about uh, little Billy. Um, but Mahone made quite a few enemies during his life. Uh, quite a few of his comrades in gray became his, uh, his violent uh, enemies after the war, some of them literally vi violent. He uh, was involved in a, in a couple of duels during his life. Well, they never came to pass, but uh, he was involved in uh, several challenges to duels during his life. Uh, here's a sampling of some of his more famous personal and political enemies. We'll start up here, top left, Jubal Early. He and Mahone had a huge falling out just a few years after the war uh, due to an article that Mahone ghost wrote in a national publication. It was actually written by a uh, uh, New York uh, fellow, a uh, Union Army veteran. Uh, for some reason, he wanted to write an article about Mahone, but uh, he made the mistake of telling Mahone that he was doing it. So Mahone wanted to see the article. And then when he did, he basically rewrote the whole thing and made some claims that he shouldn't have that Jewel Early called him out on. And uh, those two personalities kind of took off from there. And uh, they each became uh, bitter enemies for the rest of their life. Henry Heath, uh, division commander in the Army of Northern Virginia, served under A.P. Hill alongside of Mahone. Uh, Heath absolutely despised Mahone. He knew him from the very beginning of the war, if not before, and they were pretty much never on speaking terms. In fact, if you read Heath's memoirs of the war, he never mentions Mahone by name. Uh, when they were on the same battlefield, he, he uh, always just refers to Mahone as that other general, or words to that effect, and never calls him by name. Jim Kemper, who was uh, 
a politician rather than a soldier, but commanded a brigade in Pickett's division. Uh, he and Mahone, uh, they kind of went back and forth. Sometimes they worked together, sometimes they didn't. Uh, and in one of those uh, not so working uh, well together phases, uh, there was talk of a duel between the two of them. Uh, Kemper really owed his uh, uh, rise to the governorship to uh, backing by Mahone during the uh, post-war years. Fitz Lee becomes uh, Mahone's biggest political enemy after the war. And uh, not only were they uh, contrast in uh, political philosophies, they were quite the physical contrast as well. Mahone was about 5'10". If he was wearing his boots, weighed about 100 pounds soaking wet. Uh, during the uh, 1880s, Fitz Lee was probably pushing 300 pounds. Uh, so, you know, very uh, different uh, figures there. Down here, bottom left, we got Jim Lane. He and Mahone got into a spat over uh, uh, some action at the Battle of Spotsylvania in May of 1864. David Weisiger, he took over uh, command of Mahone's brigade in 1864 after Mahone was promoted to division command. They had a falling out over who should have gotten all the credit and the glory for the Battle of the Crater in July of 64. William Extra Billy Smith, he uh, served under Mahone for a short while during the uh, spring and early summer of 1862. Uh, their relationship was kind of like Kemper. You know, they, they got along when they had to, and they disagreed considerably when they had to. Uh, and it was uh, because of their inability to, to get along that uh, Smith transferred out of Mahone's brigade. He just didn't want anything more to do with Mahone after the uh, uh, seven days battle. Cadmus Wilcox, another of the uh, division commanders in AP Hill's Corps uh, for the last year or so of the war. Heath, Wilcox, and Mahone were AP Hill's three division commanders there at Petersburg and during the Appomattox campaign. But uh, Wilcox, uh, he also really had no use for Mahone. That stemmed back really to uh, Gettysburg, which I'll talk a little bit uh, greater detail about here later. But uh, they, they were never on friendly terms after that first week of July, 1863. And the their uh, relationship deteriorated as well after the war. But in addition to these guys, Mahone made quite a few enemies of just your average uh, Southerner, not necessarily soldiers, but he had quite a few enemies in Virginia and the rest of the South. And why? Well, he made an even bigger mistake than James Longstreet and John Mosby did after the war. Longstreet and Mosby, of course, became Republicans after the war. Mahone not only voted Republican, he started his own political party, the Readjusters, which uh, it, it was uh, made up considerably by a lot of uh, former slaves. Uh, so that, uh, that particular voting block did not sit well with a lot of uh, former Confederates and uh, other Southerners at the time. So as you can see, uh, Mahone had, uh, had quite a list of, uh, of enemies and opponents. Well, he's born December 1st, 1826, Southampton County, a few miles from Franklin. Uh, the house is no longer standing. It was torn down about uh, nine or 10 years ago. But here's a picture of uh, what it looked like. I think this picture was taken back in the 1930s. Um, it was a small, well, it was a planned community that, uh, that just never took off. His, uh, his father, Fielding Mahone, owned quite a bit of uh, farmland around there. Uh, there was supposed to be this little town that was going to grow up right there on the, uh, uh, on the river, uh, but the, uh, the town just, just never took off. And uh, pretty much their house was the only thing that was, that was left standing as any sort of suggestion that there was ever a town over in that part of the county. When Mahone is about four years old, uh, Nat Turner's slave rebellion happens right there in Southampton County. That puts uh, Southampton County on the, uh, on the national map. Uh, of course, the uh, fallout from uh, Turner's Rebellion was uh, quite swift and quite severe in Virginia and North Carolina, as well as other parts of the county, but particular or part of the country, but uh, particularly there in Southeast Virginia and Northeastern North Carolina. And uh, Mahone's father, Fielding, was an officer in the Southampton County Militia. Some accounts say he was actually the commander of the Southampton County Militia. So uh, Fielding Mahone was one of the first to respond to the, uh, the call to arms to put down this slave revolt. And uh, the story goes, I've never been able to, to find anything to, to back this up, but the story that uh, was passed down through the family 
was that uh, just before Fielding headed off to uh, to Cortland, which was the uh, uh, was known as Jerusalem at the time, which was the uh, Southampton County uh, County seat, uh, he put his wife and his uh, children in a boat, pushed them out into the middle of the river there in hopes that uh, if Turner came that way, uh, he would not be able to get to Mahone's family. The Mahone, uh, all of the Mahones survive uh, Turner's uh, uprising there. And a few years afterward, uh, Fielding moves the family into Jerusalem, what is now Cortland, and they will move into this. Uh, it was one of two taverns that was in the, uh, in the town at the time. He initially buys the one over here on the left, the, uh, the white one, which is right across from the courthouse and the jail today. And then uh, seeing that there's quite a bit of money to be made in the uh, tavern business, he buys the tavern next door and connects the two of them with a little uh, dog trot in between them there. And this uh, makes uh, Fielding Mahone the only tavern keeper at that, uh, at that time there in, uh, in Jerusalem. And that is the environment that young Billy will grow up in. Uh, not really the, uh, probably the, the best environment uh, for a young boy to be growing up in, you know, kind of rough around the edges, you know, a lot of drinking, a lot of gambling, a lot of smoking, you know, you get some some questionable characters coming through there. And I think part of that really helped to shape Mahone's personality. Uh, he was never a big guy, even as a kid. He was, he was always, you know, scrawny, really, uh, really bony kid. And uh, whether or not uh, he was picked on, I don't know. But uh, something, uh, whether it was, you know, in response to other kids picking on him or what, I don't know. He became the, uh, the town bully. Uh, several uh, contemporary accounts say that uh, when you saw little uh, Billy Mahone walking down the street, you crossed to the other side of the street because you just did not want to have a run-in with him. Uh, one of his uh, contemporaries referred to him as that fiendish little imp, Billy Mahone. Uh, so, you know, you have, uh, you know, young teenage uh, Billy who is somehow or, or another the, uh, the terror of the, uh, the streets of Jerusalem at that time period. Here's the tavern today. It was, uh, it was later, uh, the two buildings were later separated uh, back into two, uh, two buildings. This is Mahone's Tavern today. It's owned by the, uh, uh, the local SCV camp who are in the process of restoring it and opening up a small museum about Mahone and about uh, Southampton County and uh, Cortland itself in there. Uh, it's open, I guess it's, uh, I don't know what COVID has done to it, but it used to be open a couple uh, weekends a year uh, to go in and take a look at. Mahone doesn't get a lot of uh, formal schooling. Uh, he, he learns uh, from his dad for a while. He does go uh, to a private school in Surrey for a while, but uh, never really, uh, uh, learning just didn't really uh, take too well uh, to Mahone and vice versa. Uh, and there's a story, probably apocryphal, but there might be some grain of truth to it. One day in the tavern, uh, Mahone, who's uh, about 17 years old at this time, 17, 18, somewhere in that time frame, uh, his father is playing cards uh, there in the tavern with some of the, uh, some of the guests. And uh, Fielding is, is not doing too well. Luck is not on his side. And in fact, he's, uh, he's getting his clock clean. And uh, Billy comes in. And at that point, uh, Fielding uh, says, uh, here, Billy, uh, take my hand. See if you can do anything with it. And uh, Fielding excuses himself. And uh, Billy very quickly reverses his fortunes. He not only wins back everything that his father had lost, he cleans out everybody else at the table. And uh, Fielding comes back a uh, short while later and uh, says, okay, good job, son, I'll take your winnings. And uh, Billy replies uh, something to the effect of, you know, no, you will not, probably a little more colorful than that, but uh, no, you will not, here's what you lost, all the rest of this is mine. I'm taking my winnings and I'm going to VMI. And, uh, it's that last part of that story that I really question. Uh, I have no doubt that Billy played cards quite a bit there in the tavern. And, uh, him claiming that he was going to take his winnings and go to VMI, that didn't really happen because he does get appointed to VMI. However, he's appointed as a state cadet, so he gets a free ride. Uh, so he didn't have to pay for it. So that's why I think the, at least that last part of that story is, is, uh, is not true. But uh, he goes to VMI. Uh, very quickly finds out that uh, he's in over his head academically. His, his lack of formal schooling really comes back to bite him here in, the, in Lexington. Uh, but he puts his nose to the grindstone, so to speak, and uh, 
uh, teaches himself. Uh, he excels in math. He excels in engineering. Uh, all the military stuff, uh, infantry tactics, artillery tactics, all of that. He he excels in that. Uh, but he's he's really struggling with uh, foreign languages, uh, uh, literature, that type of stuff. You know, stuff that isn't really necessary, so to speak, uh, for a soldier. Uh, and uh, he becomes the uh, uh, cadet battalion adjutant and. Uh, he finishes top, uh, top third of his class when he graduates in 1847. And he actually considered dropping out in 1846 uh, because of the Mexican War. He uh, was considering asking for a commission in the Virginia Regiment that was going off to Mexico, but uh, uh, he did not get that, uh, uh, that position. And so he decided to stay at, uh, at Lexington and, and try again if the war was still going on after he graduated. Uh, he graduates in 1847. Uh, there's no vacancies in the uh, Virginia units that are in Mexico with, uh, with Taylor or Scott. And uh, so he begins uh, his obligation uh, to the state. One of the uh, requirements of being a state cadet was that you had to teach for a minimum of two years. And so he uh, initially is an instructor at VMI right after he graduates. Then he will get a job in uh, near Fredericksburg, a place called Rappahannock Academy. Uh, it's no longer standing. It's actually on the grounds of uh, Fort AP Hill today. Uh, it's just a historical marker there along the side of US 17. It's the only thing that uh, will ever indicate that there was a school there. But the uh, powers that be there at Rappahannock Academy decided in uh, 1847, 1848, that they wanted to become a military school. So they needed uh, some, uh, either a soldier or somebody from one of the military academies to come in and, and handle the military side of things. And that was, that was perfect for Mahone. And I suspect, I can't prove this, but I suspect that it was Francis Smith, the uh, superintendent at VMI, that got him connected with this particular opening. Uh, Mahone and Francis Smith had a, a very unique relationship, uh, kind of a mentor-mentee relationship. Uh, dating back almost to the Mahone's first days at the BMI on up to the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, Mahone would not make any kind of major decision uh, before the Civil War without first talking to Francis Smith about it. So like I say, I, I suspect that, uh, that Smith was behind this appointment, but I, I can't prove that, but I uh, feel fairly confident in saying that. And Mahone will uh, finish up his two-year commitment there and decides that, uh, well, yeah, I, I could keep doing this, but it's not really what I want to do. And uh, he decides that, uh, and of course, he talks to Francis Smith about this, and uh, he decides, you know, my, my talents really lay in the field of engineering. And so he takes a job with the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, which was being built at that time in Northern Virginia. And Mahone goes from just uh, what was basically an entry-level position at that time, a field surveyor, and uh, within a year and a half, he rises up to being one of the three section chiefs of the railroad. The ONA was built in three different uh, sections. There was one from Alexandria to uh, Culpeper and uh, one from Culpeper to Orange and I missed one. There was a third, third seg oh, from uh, Orange to Gordonsville. And uh, Mahone is put in charge of that center section. So he oversees all of the, uh, the, the surveying, the picking the, uh, the route that the railroad is going to follow, and eventually the, uh, he's still there when they start, uh, start grading. But uh, he's looking for bigger and better things. He will move on after a few years to become the chief engineer of what we know as the Orange Plank Road there west of Fredericksburg. Of course, the Orange Plank Road figures prominently in the uh, Battle of Chancellorsville and the Battle of the Wilderness. Uh, Mahone, for a period of time, was the chief engineer of this. The, the section that goes through the battlefields had already been done, but the, uh, the western end of it there, where it approaches Orange, that had not yet been completed. So he oversaw the work of that. And uh, by then, he's starting to, uh, to gain some attention around the state as, a, as an engineer that, uh, that really knows his stuff. And there's a new railroad that has just been chartered that's going to be built from Norfolk to Petersburg. And it's named, coincidentally, the Norfolk and Petersburg Railroad. And it's, uh, uh, there's actually quite a bit of uh, political wheeling and dealing going on here about who is going to be appointed the chief engineer. Mahone initially applies and doesn't get it. And because there's uh, state money that's being used to build this railroad, uh, the state was, uh, was able uh, 
uh, to uh, uh, decide who they want. Well, they had a lot of input as to, to who was going to survey the initial route. Mahone missed out on that. But then once the railroad company itself took over and the, uh, the engineer, the initial engineer was, uh, was not retained, Mahone becomes the chief engineer of the railroad. And he decides, I'm not following the route that the, that, that other guy picked out. It's, uh, it's too far north. You know, there's too many uh, uh, river crossings involved. It, it doesn't wind around, or it, it's not straight enough. It winds around too much. Uh, you know, we can do this thing and make the, make the whole line almost completely straight. And uh, when he makes this known, there's, there's not a, you know, it, it's not really a popular decision. You know, there's some folks that, that question whether or not he can do what he says he wants to do because of this thing called the Dismal Swamp. And the, the Norfolk and Petersburg has to go right through the Dismal Swamp. And Mahone says, well, that's not a problem. I, we can basically... Uh, I uh, just build a plank road across the swamp and, and, uh, and put the, uh, the rail bed on top of that. That's exactly what he does. And it, this becomes one of the straightest railroads in the country at that time. He, he finds a way across the, uh, the northern edge of the, of the dismal swamp. And uh, uh, from there, it uh, goes to Suffolk. And as you can see on the map, there is a straight line from Suffolk to Petersburg. Uh, and his route that he surveyed and that uh, he had the, uh, the track laid for. It's the same route that the railroad follows today. The rail bed through the swamp has not been moved 160 whatever years later. It's still on the same bed that Mahone designed. It never sank into the swamp like other engineers were telling him that it would, you know, kind of like the, uh, the Monty Python thing. You know, I, I built a castle. It sank into the swamp. So I built another castle. It sank into the swamp. Mahone's railroad never sank into the swamp. It's still in use today, hauling trains that weigh, you know, 20 times what uh, 1850s trains weighed. Right about the same time that he is named chief engineer of the railroad, uh, he gets married to this young lady here, Otelia Butler from Smithfield. And uh, if you've ever been to, uh, to Smithfield, which I'm sure a lot of you have, and you've seen the courthouse building there, uh, that, was actually a private residence. That was the Butler house. That is where Otelia grew up. Uh, it was not always a courthouse. It was sold uh, to her, uh, her father, Dr. Butler, and he turned it, completely converted it. If you look at pictures from when it was a private residence, you would never guess that that was a courthouse. Uh, but that is where Otelia grew up. They were married in early 1855. And uh, it was a very happy marriage uh, in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, it was a very sad marriage. They had 13 children during their marriage, only three of whom survived to adulthood. The other 10 all died uh, as children. Some of them died in infancy. Some of them uh, died uh, uh, when they were you know, uh, less than 10 years old. So that was, that was something that, uh, that really struck the two of them hard. It was a very sad part of, uh, part of their life. And uh, they were determined that they were going to have a daughter named Otelia. And every time they had a daughter, they named her Otelia. And the, the first two, maybe even first three of them died. So it's a kind of a genealogist nightmare to, to kind of try and keep track of all the uh, different Otelia, uh, Otelia Mahones in the general's life. But, uh, anyway, moving on. Shortly after they are married, they will move to, uh, to Norfolk. They rent a house on, I think it was Brook Street. Uh, it's obviously no longer there. It's over where all those apartments are over there, uh, just north of the, uh, the Wisconsin. Um, but they had not been there long when yellow fever outbreak hits Norfolk and Portsmouth. And uh, like a lot of folks, they initially stayed on. Uh, they, they thought that they would uh, somehow be immune from it. Uh, Otelia's uh, mother actually moved in with them from Smithfield. She was living with them at that time. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Butler caught yellow fever and died in, I want to say it was uh, uh, either August or September, I think, of 1855. And that was the catalyst that uh, caused uh, Billy to move his family out of town to get away from the yellow fever. They uh, they tried to go to Smithfield. Smithfield at the time was not accepting refugees from uh, Norfolk and Portsmouth. So instead, they went to live with, with uh, his family for a few months in Southampton County. Of course, the uh, yellow fever slowed down uh, construction of the railroad. 
and then put them several years behind schedule. And it wasn't until I think 1859 or 1860 when they finally got the first trains rolling between Norfolk and Portsmouth. And uh, right about the time the trains start rolling, Mahone gets elected president of the railroad. And uh, it becomes his railroad from then on for the rest of, uh, of, uh, of his days. He would always refer to the NNP as his railroad and it will be his for, for quite a while. And uh, April, 1861, Virginia secedes. She will join the new Confederacy. And several days after the uh, uh, state withdraws from the Union, Mahone is involved in the capture of Gosport Navy Yard right there in Portsmouth, right on the Elizabeth River. The, uh, he, was at, he was in Richmond actually before the uh, Ordinance of Secession was, uh, was passed. He was uh, lobbying uh, Governor Letcher for a position in the state's army, in the, uh, in the state's uh, military forces. And uh, he's able to uh, get himself commissioned as a lieutenant colonel right off the bat, and he is named Virginia's quartermaster. And uh, it's not really what he wanted. He, he wanted a field command, but uh, quartermaster was uh, at least getting his foot in the door there. And uh, he is one of three officers that is sent from Richmond to Portsmouth to uh, try and negotiate the surrender of Gosport. William Tolliver, Henry Heath, and Mahone are the three that are sent down here from Richmond. And of those three, Mahone was uh, second in rank. Heath was the junior man at that point. Interestingly enough, uh, Heath would uh, outrank Mahone very shortly thereafter, but at the beginning of the war, uh, Mahone outranked Heath. And uh, Mahone is one of those who rose across the Elizabeth River, meets with the Union commander, uh, tells him, you know, look, uh, <laughs> surrender or, or we're going we're gonna to bombard this place and uh, can't be responsible for what happens. And uh, the commander uh, declines the, the offer to surrender, shall we say. And uh, this is where Mahone really gets himself some more attention. Uh, there are troops that are arriving, militia troops that are arriving in Norfolk and Portsmouth, and they are coming by rail either on the Norfolk and Portsmouth or the uh, seaboard and Roanoke at the time. And Mahone says, well, you know what? When I was over there at the Navy Yard, I could hear the trains going by. And I know full well the uh, Yankee Navy officers over there could hear them as well. So what do you think about this, uh, General Tolliver? What, uh, what if I uh, run an empty train back and forth uh, all afternoon and all evening to make it sound like each, uh, each train is bringing in fresh troops, you know, uh, then the uh, Federals would, they'd have to surrender with, with all these uh, fresh troops that each new train is bringing in. And so that's, uh, that's the, uh, one of the tactics that they follow. Mahone will uh, run the same empty train in and out of Norfolk within earshot of Gosport all night long. And every time it arrives, he gets everybody nearby to cheer and just make a huge ruckus to make it sound like fresh troops have just arrived. And it works. And it, uh, it scares the uh, bejesus out of the uh, Federals there in the Navy Yard. And uh, they, they, of course, evacuate it. And uh, Virginia forces will go in and capture it. And Mahone was listed as the hero in all the newspaper accounts at the time for his, uh, his little uh, stunt there with the railroad. And then he was able to uh, parlay that into a promotion. He uh, gets himself promoted to colonel, and uh, he was initially sent to Smithfield uh, to uh, construct fortifications there. Those would uh, become uh, Fort Huger, and uh, I'm gonna draw a blank on the other one. Uh, the other one that's there, it'll come to me. Uh, the two forts that are there, uh, he was initially tasked with, uh, with building those. They wanted him more as an engineer than a field commander, which again, not what he wanted. So he uh, petitions the governor as, as well as General Lee, and he, uh, it pays off. He gets himself uh, transferred over to command of what becomes the 6th Virginia Infantry in Norfolk. And uh, this is him uh, around uh, early 1862. He would be commander of the 6th up until uh, late 1861. He is responsible for the city itself. Although he's not the overall commander in Southeastern Virginia, Norfolk itself is his responsibility. He commands all of the troops that are in Norfolk. There is a uh, camp of instruction that is uh, built uh, there in Norfolk, just east of the town. He oversees that as well. And uh, 
he uh, he's he's lucky in a sense because uh, uh, he's able to uh, to sleep in his own bed a lot of the time, even though his troops are encamped out around the industrial park uh, out east of town as well as along the uh, the riverfront. Uh, he spends quite a bit of his time at home. So his, uh, his troops will not see any action for the first year of the war. He gets promoted to Brigadier General in late 1861. And then, of course, Norfolk is evacuated in May of 62. Most of his troops withdraw to Petersburg. A couple of his regiments are sent out to Gordonsville. I uh, don't have time to get into to what happens to them. But most of his uh, command winds up at Drury's Bluff. And he is actually in command of the fort when the Union Navy shows up there in the James River right off of Drury's Bluff on May 15th of 1862. That's something that you don't ever see mentioned. It's always mentioned as a Navy battle. Um, well, some good reasons for that. Uh, you know, they didn't really do much good having infantry there in the fort. Uh, it was pretty much a matter of just uh, loading the guns that were, that were in the fort and pointing them out in the river and pulling the lanyard. Uh, so there wasn't really much for him to do, uh, but uh, he was in command there. He actually had his troops uh, positioned along the riverbank and the sketch down here, you can see some of the uh, uh, smoke puffs down here on each side of the river. Those are Mahone's guys. The uh, 6th Virginia was over here on the east bank of the river and the uh, 12th Virginia and 3rd uh, Alabama were over here on the, uh, the fort side of the river uh, taking pot shots at anybody that, uh, that showed themselves on the Union vessels. Uh, so that is their, uh, their baptism of fire, although they don't really do much there. Their real baptism of fire comes a couple of weeks later at Seven Pines. Uh, Mahone only has half of his brigade. He, he commands six regiments at this time, but he only has three of them at uh, Seven Pines. Um, without going into too much detail here, Seven Pines, it, it starts the, uh, the day before at, at the end of May, and it, it's a disaster from the, uh, from the Confederate point of view. Uh, commands were in the wrong place. Uh, the, the officers involved are, are still green. Uh, the terrain was extremely muddy. Uh, they could not get across some of the uh, flooded waterways down there. And this is a naturally swampy area to begin with. Uh, so it's just a, a, a comedy of errors, I believe is what uh, Douglas Freeman referred to it as. Mahone's people are not engaged on the first day. Uh, they become uh, right in the middle of things on the second day, June 1st, 1862. You can see them. I've got them circled over here in yellow on the map. They would. Uh, be right over, uh, pretty much right where Interstate 64 cuts through the battlefield today. Uh, Mahone, uh, even though he's not uh, under D.H. Hill's uh, command, uh, usually he falls under D.H. Hill's tactical command here at Seven Pines. Uh, Hill was the guy who was running most of the fight here at Seven Pines on the first. And Mahone reports to Hill that morning, uh, here again because of the conditions of the field, it had taken him a while to get there. I don't know that uh, Mahone and Hill had ever met prior to this morning. Uh, and Mahone rides up to Hill that morning, you know, to report for duty. And uh, his good morning, General, uh, is, is greeted with a, uh, simply a cold and very icy, you're late from General Hill. Well, Mahone didn't really realize that he was running late. Uh, uh, so they, they, do not get, uh, they do not get off on the right foot here. And... Uh, Mahone asks for orders. Hill tells him, uh, just go in those woods over there. And Mahone replies, well, is there any enemy in there? Nope, I just came from in there. Woods are empty. And unfortunately, Mahone takes him at his word. Uh, he sends his regiments in uh, without deploying skirmishers. He has no advance uh, troops out in front to tell him uh, if there is any enemy presence. So he's moving into unfamiliar territory blind. And his, uh, his troops, again, this is their, their first time really seeing action. In my mind, Drury's Bluff doesn't count. Uh, they're moving into some very thick and swampy woods here. Um, again, first battle, officers are, are, are still relatively green. And in that terrain, all three of his regiments, they, they each go their own separate way. The 3rd uh, Alabama, uh, they actually have a little bit of success. They actually wind up driving the Federals back, but they take some horrendous casualties. 41st Virginia gets separated. Uh, they wind up running into uh, one of Lewis Armistead's regiments. I believe it was 9th Virginia, which is another uh, Hampton Roads area unit. And the uh, 41st and the 9th exchange friendly fire for a while. They actually inflicted more casualties on each other than the Federals did. 
and the uh, 12th Virginia was the last one to get on the field. They move in and they wind up walking right into a, a trap. Uh, they move right across the front of a Union regiment. They didn't know it was there. They get surprised when the Yankees fire into their flank. And long story short, all three regiments of Mahone's brigade start falling back of their own volition initially out of the woods. Mahone tries to stop him. He's unable to do so and finally just says, all right, go ahead. I can't stop you, so I'll give the order. Fall back. They fall back to the Williamsburg Road, which is uh, today U.S. 60, to reform. And as the 12th Virginia is coming out of the woods in confusion, who is standing there? D.H. Hill. And D.H. Hill, he's a a very interesting fella. Uh, he, he's not what we would call a people person. Uh, he doesn't like Virginians. Hill is a North Carolinian. He, he thinks Virginians are very conceited and, uh, and arrogant, and he, he does not like them, with the exception of his, of his brother-in-law, Stonewall Jackson. And um, when he sees this Virginia unit falling out of the woods, uh, he goes up to him and just lays into him, starts calling him cowards. And uh, eventually one of the guys from the 12th runs over and finds Mahone, tells him what's going on. Mahone rides up on the scene, tells uh, Hill, why are you yelling at my men? I gave the order to fall back. And Hill says, oh, I take it back. Your men aren't cowards, you are. And so the two of them uh, uh, start going at it. You know, the last thing that uh, anybody wants to do is, uh, is insult uh, Mahone. You know, he's not one to back down from a fight. And the fact that there are bullets flying around, that, that doesn't change his attitude. He, he's not going to stand for this. So he's giving it right back to Hill, even though that's his, uh, that's his superior officer. And uh, finally, I think it was uh, George Pickett rode up on the, on the scene and said, I need reinforcements quick. I'm, my men are getting overrun. And Hill says, well, I can take this brigade, but I don't think they'll help you any, you know, taking one last shot at Mahone. And uh, off Mahone's guys go over here to their right to reinforce Pickett. And I've mentioned all of this because the next day, uh, Mahone decides that he's going to challenge Hill to a duel. And uh, he calls over Roger Pryor, his good buddy, who's another one from, from Southeastern Virginia. And uh, he wants Pryor to, to deliver the, uh, the challenge to Hill. And uh, Pryor uh, talks him out of it. It's, it's pretty sad when, uh, when Roger Pryor is the voice of reason. <laughs> if you know anything about Roger Pryor, he was one of the uh, fire-eating uh, pro-secession guys. <laughs> So for him to, uh, to, uh, to talk Mahone down, that, uh, that says a lot right there. Uh, so that, uh, that duel never came, uh, never came to pass, but uh, Hill and Mahone hated each other for the rest of their days and 12th Virginia never forgave D.H. Hill for uh, uh, his treatment of them there at Seven Pines. So that was, that was their real uh, baptism of fire. Uh, they will be heavily engaged again at, uh, at uh, Malvern Hill a couple of days later. They're on the extreme Confederate right, uh, attacking all the uh, Union artillery over there. And Mahone just takes horrendous, horrendous casualties over there. And um, of course, nobody had any success in breaking the Union line there at Malvern Hill. Mahone was no different. His men got, uh, uh, they got up fairly close, but they did not break through. Their next action will come at 2nd Manassas in late August of 62. Uh, Mahone is part of Richard Anderson's division by this point in, uh, in James Longstreet's Corps. And uh, Mahone will be on the extreme right when Longstreet launches his counterattack that uh, hits, the, uh, hits the flank of John Pope's Army of Virginia there. Mahone's guys are the extreme right of that uh, attacking force. Uh, the brigade uh, performs well. Mahone never got into action. Just as his men were, were moving forward and coming under fire, he gets wounded. And uh, he was right in front of the, uh, the 12th Virginia and the guys who left the counts of it said they thought he was dead, just watching the way that, uh, hearing the sound of, of him being struck and just watching the way that he crumpled over. They thought he was dead before he hit the ground. But he got lucky because he gets hit right in the gut with the mini ball that struck one of the bullets on his uniform. It was as if the, uh, the federal soldier that fired it was aiming at that bullet. Uh, all the accounts say he could not have hit that thing any squarer on than he did. And so it's an extremely, extremely painful wound. It broke several of his ribs, caused a huge bruise, uh, but it did not, uh, did not break the skin. And uh, the doctors were, uh, were, they were expecting the worst when they went out there to get him, uh, but they found him just uh, in a lot of pain and uh, the bullet was actually found in his boot when they uh, uh, were, 
when once they got him up on the operating table. And that evening, when the uh, reports from the battle make their way back to Richmond, one of the uh, reports mentions that General Mahone was wounded. And Governor Letcher uh, was there when the when uh, the reports from Lee's army are coming in, and he sees this uh, sees this report that says that his friend was wounded, and he knows that uh, Otelia is uh, is in Richmond at that time. She's uh, volunteering as a nurse at one of the hospitals. So he decides, well, I'll take the news to her. She'll she'll take it much better if she hears it from me. So he goes and tracks her down, and he he's he means well. <laughs> he's trying to reassure her that uh, that Billy is okay. And uh, he goes up and, and, and tells her, well, uh, uh, I hate to tell you, but uh, your husband, he was wounded in, in the battle today. But don't worry. Don't worry. I'm told that it's only a flesh wound. And she that's apparently, you know, uh, uh, made her even more concerned than she already was. She replies back something to the effect of, now I know it's serious. Billy has no extra flesh at all. And uh, that's one of the, uh, the most famous uh, Mahone anecdotes from the entire war. And uh, he would be out of action for uh, a few months there. Uh, he missed out on the Maryland campaign, was not at South Mountain or Sharpsburg. Uh, his brigade got almost wiped out at Crampton's Gap there at South Mountain. There was, uh, I believe, about 70 of his guys were present at Sharpsburg. Uh, they did not even fight as a separate brigade. They fell in under uh, under Pryor's command. It's just a, a small battalion in Pryor's brigade. Um, but Mahone himself is left in Northern Virginia there for a while to recuperate from his wound. Of course, there's not much you can do for broken ribs. Uh, medical science hasn't changed much today. There's still not a lot you can do for broken ribs other than just sit there and wait for them to heal. And he was at a house outside of Upperville there in Northern Virginia when Yankee cavalry came through on a raid. They had heard that there were several wounded Confederate generals there. And it was Mahone and Ewell uh, was, was, was the, uh, the ones that they were looking for, but they didn't know who they were but they actually ride right up to the house that Mahone is recuperating in. And it's one of those deals as they're coming up on the front porch, he's scrambling out the back door and uh, they search the house. They find his uniform. They find some of his stuff there. They know he's there, but they can't find him. He's in the, in the backyard hiding in the garden. And one of his staff later joked that, uh, yeah, the general got away because he was hiding under a cabbage leaf. And that became another, uh, fun little uh, uh, joke there at Mahone's expense that uh, made its rounds through the brigade later about how he, he hid by hiding under a cabbage leaf. And uh, he would rejoin the army uh, a couple of weeks before Fredericksburg. He would rejoin them uh, in late November of 62. He's present at Fredericksburg, but he's on the extreme left, uh, was really a spectator there at uh, Fredericksburg. Uh, not the case at Chancellorsville the following May. Uh, because the Army of Northern Virginia is stretched out from Germana all the way down to, to, uh, to Port Republic, uh, Mahone's position over toward the left of that line, he was one of the first units that was sent to go engage Hooker when he's coming through the wilderness there uh, uh, along the Orange Turnpike and the Orange Plank Road, which, as we know, Mahone had, uh, had worked for earlier, uh, just a few years before the war. Uh, he's heavily engaged there uh, throughout the battle at Chancellorsville. He will be heavily engaged at Salem Church as well. Uh, he actually operates under Lee's eye for quite a bit of the action there at Chancellorsville. Uh, Lee actually took tactical command of the brigade for a short period there at Chancellorsville. And uh, uh, he really distinguished himself there. Uh, he distinguishes himself for the wrong reasons at Gettysburg. Uh, Anderson's division arrives uh, too late to do anything uh, on the evening of July 1st. And on July 2nd, uh, Anderson's division is supposed to be supporting Longstreet in his attack on the Confederate right and the Confederate center. Longstreet's two divisions, Hood and McClaws, of course, go to the, uh, uh, the Round Tops, the Peach Orchard, the Wheat Field, uh, uh, driving uh, sickles out of those areas. Uh, then as the attack rolls north, uh, Anderson's division gets engaged, his three brigades on the right get engaged, and then the, as it continues to, to roll north, it gets to Mahone's brigade, and the attack stops. Uh, Mahone, uh, nobody knows where A.P. Hill is. His, his uh, whereabouts uh, uh, on July 2nd are, are a mystery to just about everybody. Uh, and uh, Anderson uh, is kind of the same deal. Uh, Mahone would... Uh, uh, when one of the other brigade commanders uh, requested uh, Mahone to, to move forward to, to support him, uh, 
Mahone replied, well, I have orders from General Anderson to, to stay here. I'm in reserve until I'm needed. And I believe it was Ambrose Wright uh, was pleading with him, well, you're needed. Come forward now. My, my guys were up there on the ridge. We need support on our left. And Mahone says, nope, Anderson told me to wait here. And so they go back and forth for a while like that. Uh, one of Anderson's staff officers comes up, tries to get Mahone to move forward. Nope, Anderson told me to stay here. Well, I just came from Anderson. He wants you to move forward. Nope, I'm not doing it unless Anderson himself tells me. And so they go back and forth like this. And by the time Mahone finally does move forward, it's after dark and it, there's no point in him moving forward. Uh, so he finally does go. So the people that say he didn't move on July 2nd, they're not entirely correct. He did move forward, just too late to do anything. The, the shooting had pretty much stopped by the time he, by the time he went forward in the dark. Um, and that caused a, a huge falling out uh, between Mahone and Cadmus Wilcox and uh, Ambrose Wright and probably some of the other uh, commanders as well who uh, uh, needed Mahone to come up uh, to their support and, and he stayed put there on, uh, on Seminary Ridge. He would actually turn in his resignation in the wake of Gettysburg and I think part of that is because of uh, all the fingers being pointed his way uh, because of his uh, failure to, to really do anything on July 2nd but also he was still running the railroad. He never resigned as president of the Norfolk and Petersburg. And even though Norfolk had fallen, the western half of the railroad from Petersburg to, uh, uh, I believe, Zunai was still in operation. And uh, so he was still remotely overseeing the, uh, the operation of the railroad. And I think he, he wanted to go back and actually take personal charge of that. And also, he was uh, appointed to the, uh, the state legislature at the same time. So there's, uh, there's really three factors uh, behind his resignation, but Lee rejects it. He, uh, he does not uh, accept Mahone's resignation, so he stays with the Army. And he will be uh, engaged at, uh, at Bristow Station, not the, not the initial bloodbath where, where uh, Hill blundered into the, uh, the Union Army, but he would be uh, engaged in the follow-up action there. But he won't, uh, he won't see action again until, uh, until the wilderness. Uh, they spend the, uh, the winter, 63, 64, near Orange. Again, he's quite familiar with the area. And his men actually operate a shoe factory. Uh, they take over an empty church building. And Lee was having real problems with the quartermaster department getting footwear for his army. And Mahone had a couple of cobblers uh, in his unit. They started making shoes at first just, just for the brigade. And Lee got one to this and said, well, let me see a couple of these for samples. And so he looked at the ones that Mahone's men were making and he looked at what Richmond was providing and decided that the ones from Richmond, they just, they, you know, they couldn't hold a candle to, to what Mahone's guys were making. So Lee tells Richmond, stop sending me finished shoes, send me leather and nails and Mahone's guys will make shoes for the entire army. So that's, that's what his guys do for a lot of the, uh, the winter 63, 64. Uh, they will be engaged uh, at the wilderness on the second day. Again, uh, Anderson is not there the first day, Longstreet's guys don't put in an appearance until the second day. And this is where Mahone's career really starts to, uh, to take a different turn here. Uh, he'd been really just a, a, a mediocre, a, a competent brigade commander up until this point. Uh, but now he finds himself in command of a larger uh, amount of troops. Uh, as part of the, uh, the second day's action here, Longstreet launches a counterattack against, uh, against the Federals. And that includes a flanking column of four brigades moving along uh, just south of the Orange Plank Road. Again, terrain that Mahone knew very, very well. Mahone was the senior uh, uh, brigade commander with that force, so he took tactical command of it. And uh, this was his, uh, his first real uh, shot here at uh, what amounts to division command. And as uh, Winfield Hancock said, uh, they rolled him up like a wet blanket. And uh, that really uh, saved Lee's army there uh, that day and uh, put the Federals back on their heels uh, there at the wilderness. And that uh, unfortunate side effect of, of, that, uh, of that attack is the wounding of James Longstreet by Mahone's men. Uh, just as the, uh, the assault is running out of steam, uh, they're, they're right in the neighborhood of the Orange Plank Road. Uh, they've driven all the Federals away. They're right there at the road. Uh, but if you've been to the wilderness, you know how thick those woods are. Add to that smoke from, uh, from the woods themselves catching on fire, uh, the battle smoke from, the, uh, from all the small arms, as well as just the overall confusion of battle. And you couldn't see anything in there. And uh, 
Mahone's troops get separated. It's actually his brigade, the, uh, the 12th and the 41st uh, drift apart. Uh, I think it was the 12th went across the road. The rest of the brigade uh, stayed south of it. And uh, just as those two units are on opposing sides of the Orange Plank Road, who comes riding up the Orange Plank Road? Why, James Longstreet and a whole host of others. And uh, Mahone's guys, they hear, they can't see him. They hear troops coming down the road. Uh, they know that the, the Federals have run off. They think this might be the approach of Federal cavalry. And so they, they shoot first and ask questions later. And into this crossfire uh, rides Longstreet. Longstreet is wounded in the shoulder. Micah Jenkins, one of his brigade commanders, is killed. Uh, several staff officers are struck. And this takes place in just a matter of seconds before they figure out what has happened and the shooting finally stops. Uh, but this was, you know, just a couple of miles from where uh, Stonewall Jackson was felled by friendly fire. And now it looks like it's happened again with Longstreet at the hands of Mahone's guys. Uh, Longstreet, uh, he would survive the wound, but he's out of action until October of 64. The brigade will move with the rest of the army to Spotsylvania, and they will be heavily engaged on May 12th, which is when the Federals overrun the mule shoe as Lee is trying to ease the pressure there on the mule shoe and uh, uh, kind of re reversed the, the uh, tactical situation, he orders a counterattack east of the mule shoe with Mahone's brigade and James Lane's brigade. Mahone is the senior of these two, so he's gonna be in command of this. And uh, the two brigades go forward, they're stacked one behind the other, Lane engages first, and when, uh, when his attack is spent, Mahone's guys come up to relieve them. Well, Lane's guys captured uh, several flags, and as his men are bringing them back to the rear, they run into Mahone himself. And he says, oh, yes, thank you, I'll take those. And uh, he's in the process of taking these flags when uh, several, of the North Carolina, uh, several of the North Carolinians take issue with this. And one of them, uh, it looked like he was going to kill Mahone on the spot. You can, see the, uh, you can see the quote here from the Lieutenant Colonel of the 18th North Carolina, which incidentally is the same regiment that shot Jackson. But anyway. Uh, Advancing toward Mahone with his hat in one hand and his pistol cocked in the other, Colonel Cowan of the 33rd North Carolina told Mahone how he, Mahone, had run instead of going with us into the charge that Mahone's brigade had acted badly and had nothing to do with the captured flags. Among other severe epithets, he called Mahone a cowardly son of a hmm and told him to apologize for his language or he would kill him on the spot. Surprisingly, Mahone backed down. Mahone took his cussing without a word back, made a profound apology, and rode back inside of the breastworks. This is probably the only time that Mahone backed down from the fight. And uh, I, I neglected to mention uh, that in the, in the aftermath of, of Longstreet's uh, wounding, Richard Anderson was uh, promoted to command of Longstreet's Corps. Mahone advanced to command of Anderson's division. That becomes important. Kind of kind of forgot about that. Oops. They will be involved for the rest of the, uh, the Overland campaign at the North Anna and Cold Harbor. They actually uh, have quite a bit of success at the North Anna. And uh, then they get to Petersburg. And if you read Mahone's account of this, uh, it's a wonder that, uh, that Lee lost the war because he had Mahone as his confidant. Uh, Mahone had quite a high opinion of himself and uh, was very prone uh, to inflating his claims uh, of, of what he actually did of his exploits uh, during the war. And one of those involves his arrival at Petersburg. Once Lee was finally convinced that the, uh, all of Grant's people were there at Petersburg, uh, according to Mahone, Lee immediately sent for little Billy, knowing full well that Mahone knew all of the terrain around Petersburg like the back of his hand. And so he needed uh, little Billy to explain to him the terrain and also to tell him what to do. So again, uh, Mahone, that's a very high opinion of himself here. And uh, uh, there, there's some truth to that. Uh, Lee actually did seek him out uh, not long after getting to Petersburg, but, but not to ask him what to do. He just wanted to know <laughs> uh, about the terrain around there. Because again, this was, uh, Mahone was quite familiar with it, having surveyed it and built a railroad through it. Uh, but anyway, uh, Battle of the Crater, July 30th, 1864. Uh, we've settled into a siege by then. The Federals have not been able to, uh, uh, to break through Lee's lines and capture Petersburg. So they decide, well, if we can't go through them or around them, we're going to go under them. And uh, so uh, 
one of Burnside's regiments, 48th Pennsylvania, digs a tunnel under uh, Confederate lines. They actually, uh, the entrance to the tunnel is just up the hill from the Norfolk and Petersburg Railroad. And uh, they tunnel under Confederate lines, put a couple of tons of uh, gunpowder in there and blow a hole right in the Confederate lines. And it's, uh, it's Mahone who is charged with, uh, counter, uh, with uh, countering the, uh, the federal advance there at the crater. He will move three of his brigades uh, from farther to the right. He will bring them up uh, pretty much the ravine where uh, uh, Interstate 95 is today to, to keep them out of sight. And they will uh, arrive in rear of the crater and this will be his finest day on the battlefield. And he is not shy about telling people about that, that this was his finest day on the battlefield. And uh, his, uh, his men will drive Burnside's people uh, first into the crater and then back to their own lines and uh, restores the, uh, the Confederate position. And it's uh, rather unfortunate, uh, to put it mildly, what happens after that. Uh, one of the uh, uh, Union divisions that, uh, that was involved in the attack was an all black division. And by the time uh, Mahone's guys get up there to the crater, their fighting blood is up. And then when they discover that they are fighting uh, black troops, uh, they, uh, they don't accept the surrender of these black troops or a lot of their white officers. And a, a, a massacre ensues there at the crater. Uh, and to his credit, when Mahone found out about it, he put a stop to it immediately. Uh, one of the uh, uh, contemporary accounts of it is uh, his exact words were, uh, it makes me sick. And uh, he put an immediate stop to that once he found out that it was going on. But uh, unfortunately, it, it was uh, a little bit of time before he uh, learned about it and put a stop to that. So that's a uh, uh, kind of puts a bit of a damper, if you will, uh, on his uh, what was his finest day on the battlefield. And uh, Richmond newspapers uh, portrayed him as the hero, and it was uh, very quickly repeated by papers across the South, and he receives. Uh, what is in essence a battlefield promotion to Major General uh, a couple days later for his performance at the crater. Here's a, here you can see his, uh, his troops coming in behind the crater. He actually commissioned a painting of the crater. So proud was he of his, uh, of his actions there and how it, uh, it made not only his uh, military career, but it, uh, this was really the basis for his uh, political career as well. Uh, him being able to uh, uh, point to himself as the hero of the crater. And so John Elder, a uh, uh, very famous uh, artist at the time from Fredericksburg, uh, painted this. It, it, uh, it hung over the fireplace in the Mahone household from 1869 onward. Uh, I've seen the original. It is in the Commonwealth Club in, uh, in Richmond today. They wouldn't let me take it. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't get it off the wall and, and sneak out the door without them seeing. So. It's still there, I wasn't able to bring it home. Mahone will be at Petersburg uh, for the rest of the war, runs afoul of Henry Heath and Cadmus Wilcox on a couple occasions when they have to work together. Uh, but A.P. Hill was more or less able to keep the peace between his three division commanders. And in early uh, 1865, because Mahone had done so much fighting uh, south of Petersburg, uh, Lee decided to give his people a rest. He pulled him out of the Petersburg lines and sent him into Bermuda 100 to man the Howlett line. And so he is there uh, when Petersburg falls on April 2nd, 1865, and he will join the, uh, the rest of Lee's army at Amelia Courthouse once they give up Petersburg and Richmond. And as they are headed westward, uh, they come to this bridge over the Appomattox River right outside of Farmville. This carries the South Side Railroad across the Appomattox and a very imposing structure. And it was Lee's strategy that if he could get the Appomattox between him and Grant, he might somehow miraculously be able to escape. Uh, but the key part of that was that High Bridge had to be destroyed. And of course, you can see the railroad bridge in this picture. What you can't see is down right about here, there's a wagon bridge. So there's actually two bridges at Farmville. And Mahone was in command of the rear guard. It was his task to see that these two bridges were destroyed after the army passed. Well, you can see in the picture, no problem destroying uh, several spans of the railroad bridge. The problem was that nobody torched the little wagon bridge down here on the valley floor. And so 
the Federals are able to cross the Appomattox right here at High Bridge and uh, catch up with Lee and force, of course, his surrender at Appomattox. And this is squarely on Mahone's shoulders. Uh, so you can, you can if, if you wanted to, you could blame Mahone for the surrender of the Army in Northern Virginia and not be incorrect. Uh, Mahone himself tried to point the fingers at the, uh, the engineers and said, and blame them and say, well, I told them to do it and they didn't do it, but that, that doesn't hold water. It, it was, it, this was, this one's on him, not, uh, not Talcott's engineers. And whoops, kind of hit myself. Uh, of course, the army will surrender several days after that at Appomattox and uh, Lee and Mahone would, uh, would meet uh, the night before the, uh, the surrender. Uh, Mahone was still uh, fiery to the end, was dead set against surrender, uh, told Lee, you know, yes, let's, let's fight our way out of this. Uh, but then once that, uh, once that didn't happen, uh, he, he went and sought advice from Lee and uh, Lee told him, uh, rebuild Virginia as best you can. Go back to your railroad, rebuild your railroad. That will help get Virginia back on its economic footing. And so that's what he does. After Norfolk fell, uh, Otelia had moved to Clarksville into this house. Uh, it's still there today, uh, up on the hill in, the, in downtown Clarksville. And uh, this is where Mahone goes after the war. Uh, after uh, after uh, Appomattox, he makes his way here to Clarksville and he runs what's left of the railroad uh, from Clarksville here for a while. Then he goes back to Norfolk. Uh, their house had survived. And uh, don't I can't find a lot about what he does in the immediate aftermath, but I know he was involved with the city's waterworks. Uh, he became the uh, city waterworks chief engineer there in Norfolk while he's still uh, trying to rebuild the railroad. Uh, but the, the Norfolk and Petersburg is in a lot better shape than most Southern railroads uh, because the Yankees had put it in operation from Norfolk to Suffolk. Uh, the only thing they had done was change the gauge of it. So that part was still ready to go. Uh, so he had a, a ready-made uh, railroad for it. So there were was not a lot of rebuilding uh, to go. All they had to do was just change the gauge back so they could use their, their original stuff once the uh, uh, US military railroad equipment vanished. And uh, so the NMP is back in, in working order pretty soon after the war. And uh, Mahone would move from Clarksville to Petersburg and that's where he will, will set up shop. And Petersburg becomes probably the most politically important city in Virginia. Uh, for about the next uh, 20, 25 years or so because of Billy Mahone. And it's an interesting story. I guess this is a rabbit hole worth going down. Mahone thought that he owned this house here in Clarksville. Uh, he found out uh, the guy he bought it from didn't actually own it. <laughs> so uh, he was forced to, uh, to look for new housing. That's, why, that's one of the reasons why he wound up moving to Petersburg. He was ousted from this house that he didn't really own there in Clarksville. And uh, he will uh, get the, as I mentioned, get the NNP back going. Uh, then he acquires the Southside Railroad, you know, the one that crossed High Bridge. He acquires that. Uh, he becomes president of the Virginia and Tennessee. So he's got three railroads that stretch all the way across Virginia. NNP goes from Norfolk to Petersburg. Southside goes from Petersburg to Lynchburg. And the Virginia and Tennessee goes from Lynchburg to Bristol. And so if he's running all three of these railroads, why don't we just combine them into one? And this was a this was a big political issue because state money had been had been used to build uh, these railroads, and uh, here he is trying to privatize them. And uh, this was uh, very controversial. And uh, nonetheless, he's successful, and he combines all three into the Atlantic, Mississippi, and Ohio, which his detractors referred to as the All Mine and Otelias. And he is on his way to becoming the richest man in Virginia because of this railroad. Here's some AMO stock. While he's living in Petersburg, he has uh, his own office of the A, well, first the South Side, but then the AMO right here in the uh, South Side Depot. It's still standing. Uh, this was his office right here up on the uh, second floor corner. Uh, it had freight wings going out to each side here. The one over here on this side was taken out by a tornado back, I think, in the mid-90s. Uh, but the rest of the building was spared and is still there today. This was his mansion that he lived in in Petersburg. Uh, it became the uh, Petersburg Library after his death. And uh, if you've read, I think it's uh, Lee's Lieutenants by Freeman. It could be Lee, but I think it's Lee's Lieutenants. Uh, he mentions 
Freeman mentions going to see a reunion in Petersburg when he was a young kid and seeing General Mahone's uh, widow up on a porch across the street. He's referring to this house. He was watching a parade of veterans of Mahone's brigade and he was uh, standing right opposite the Mahone mansion uh, watching that. Mahone was a very popular tour guide uh, for units of both sides that came to visit the old battlefields there. Here he is at the crater uh, with the 57th Massachusetts in 1887. Uh, there he is right there in the middle, looking like a very dapper garden gnome with his, uh, his pointed beard there. And uh, you can see, you know, he gets a lot of flack for being such a, a short guy. Now he did have platform heels in his boots. So that, that gives him about it's another inch and a half, two inches. Um, and of course he's wearing a top hat, but he's really not much shorter than everybody else in this picture. But he, he still was a scrawny little dude, but he, he wasn't, uh, you, know, you know, five, six, like some accounts make him out to be. He, he, was, he was taller than most folks give him credit for. Him. Here he is at Gettysburg in 1893. Here he is right here. Dan Sickles, James Longstreet, Oliver Howard, Lawrence Chamberlain, among others. And uh, Mahone and Sickles and Longstreet together. There's probably no, nothing good came from that. Came from that. Mahone would, uh, as I alluded to earlier, form his own political party uh, in the uh, post-Civil War years, uh, the Readjusters. They were so called because, in part, West Virginia splitting off and uh, not taking what was viewed as its share of Virginia's uh, debt. And uh, some folks, they were called the funders, said, well, folks in Richmond should pay the entire debt, you know, even though a third of the state just broke off and, you know, doesn't have any debt. And uh, Mahone was the, the leader of the other side that said, well, no, we're, gonna, we're going to adjust, readjust, if you will, the state's debt down to reflect you know, the loss of a, a, a third of the state. And uh, they became known as the readjusters. And uh, not only did they vote Republican on most things, but uh, a lot of the uh, former slaves who were now uh, free and uh, had the right to vote, Mahone courted them. And uh, historians are still torn, you know, the jury's still out. Was he doing it because he really cared about their plight and wanted to see uh, uh, their lot in life bettered? Or was he doing it just for his own selfish means and realized that that was a, a built-in voting block that would support him if he, you know, if, if he dangled a few carrots, so to speak, you know, was he building his, was he using them basically for his, for his own political career? And the historians are still split on that. Um, I think there's a little bit of both, honestly. Uh, he did actually care about the plight of the, the former slaves. He did quite a bit uh, uh, to help them in, in the way of, of, of education and, uh, and other things, helping them uh, to, try and, to try and better their situation in post-Civil War Virginia. And uh, as you might expect, he got a lot of flack for that. Uh, Danville riot, among other things, uh, was, uh, uh, pointed at, uh, was pointed at the readjusters. Um, and, uh, you know, voting Republican, you know, that, that made him, you know, persona non grata in the eyes of a lot of Confederates. Uh, but uh, uh, he was the political force to be reckoned with during the uh, late 1870s, early 1880s. Uh, unfortunately, he lost his railroad during that time and one of the uh, uh, economy crashes at that time, it wound up uh, being bought out and uh, uh, combined with the uh, Shenandoah Valley Railroad became uh, the Norfolk and Western Railroad, but uh, he'd made his fortune on that. And uh, he had some good investments as well. He was quite probably the richest man in Virginia when he died in, uh, in 1895. He uh, ran for governor, did not get it, but uh, he was pulling the strings uh, of the folks in Richmond. You know, he may not be the guy sitting in the chair, but he was the guy behind the curtain who was uh, manipulating everything. He did uh, get elected to uh, to the Senate uh, in Washington for one term, and uh, that was that was really the height of his uh, of his political career. Uh, he had a uh, very fancy mausoleum uh, constructed for uh, for himself and Otelia in uh, in Blandford Cemetery, just uh, almost a stone's throw from the crater there southeast of, of downtown Petersburg. And what of Mahone's legacy? Well. Uh, he was, uh, as I as I mentioned several times, you know, he was very controversial during his life. You know, when uh, when Early was really responsible for uh, how the Confederacy and the Army of Northern Virginia how they were going to be remembered, 
because of his personal dislike of Mahone, Mahone was not mentioned. You know, there's that famous painting of Lee and his generals. Guess who's not in it? And it's not because he's, you know, uh, hiding behind Fitz Lee, you know, and, and you can't see him. Uh, Mahone was intentionally left out of that. He was written out of Confederate history uh, in the post-war years because of his political actions. Uh, had he not done that, um, his, you know, his personal feuds with other generals could have been overlooked. You know, he was not the only one to feud with Jubal Early. He was not the only one to feud with D.H. Hill. That could have been overlooked. It was his political actions after the war that got him written out of the, uh, the Confederate story. And it wasn't until after his death that, uh, that people revisited the idea of, well, well, how do we remember Mahone and the, uh, the Daughters of the Confederacy? They erected this monument uh, to him on the battlefield at the crater. And it, this was not an, e an easy decision that was reached. There was, a, there was a lot of discussion about this. You know, was Mahone worthy of a monument? And once it was decided, well, yes, he is. To, for all of his faults, he, he deserves a monument. Well, where do we put it? Well, what was Mahone's greatest day during the war? The crater. So the, the theory was that if we put a monument to Mahone at the crater, it's honoring his military legacy and nothing else. Uh, there's no mention uh, either written on there or implied of his later political career. This is truly honoring Mahone, the soldier, because there was talk of uh, putting a, a statue of him on the Capitol grounds. That did not come to pass. Uh, there was talk of uh, having uh, some sort of memorial to him at VMI did not come to pass. He had too many political enemies. And uh, so this is the only uh, Mahone monument uh, that was ever erected uh, is the one there on the battlefield at the crater. Uh, there's a stretch of 460 uh, between Petersburg and Norfolk that uh, is known, well, I don't know if it still is or not, but it, uh, it was known as the, uh, the General Mahone Highway, uh, that stretch where it paralleled the, uh, the Norfolk and Petersburg. Up until recent years, uh, Norfolk Southern uh, was, uh, was big on Mahone's memory. Uh, Norfolk and Western had a, uh, had a uh, diner. Uh, it's number 493 was known as, the, or it was named the General William Mahone. I believe that one, I don't remember whether that was on the Powhatan era or the Pocahontas, but uh, it was one of their uh, uh, top of the line dining cars. Um, then uh, Norfolk Southern on their business train, they had another business car. You can see a picture of it right here that was named after Mahone. Uh, they have quite a bit of his personal possessions uh, is, uh, is in the possession of Norfolk Southern. Uh, I don't know how much of that, if any, they divested themselves of when they, when they left town and <laughs> skipped out to Atlanta, uh, but they had quite a bit of his stuff. And this is one that is often overlooked in Mahone's legacy. Virginia State, Univ or, yeah, Virginia State University, just outside of Petersburg. Uh, this was established by the readjusters. This was one of Mahone's biggest contributions, and he is not mentioned anywhere on this. This started out as the Virginia Normal and Collegiate Institute. This was a, uh, a school for African Americans, and uh, you will not find his name anywhere. But again, this is perhaps one of his, his biggest legacies in the state, uh, was, the, was the creation of BSU. And all of this goes to say that Virginia found Mahone difficult to live with, but impossible to ignore. That is a quote from the great Virginia historian, Virginius Dabney. And that is a short glimpse into the life of Billy Mahone. I will be glad to, to field some questions if there are any. Charlie, thank you so much. I neglected to mention to y'all, there is a chat feature uh, and or a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, you may type them in now and Charlie will answer them all brilliantly, I know. <laughs> um, Charlie, that was so interesting. And of course, now it's very clear why we know so little about Billy Mahone. He just was, basically his story was suppressed for a long time. Is that exactly. a good way to put it? Yeah. Is it difficult to find um, information about him? Uh, COVID notwithstanding, I know a lot of institutions have limited hours or reduced hours, but have you had a difficult time finding information about him? There's no shortage of, of stuff either by his own hand or, or from others writing to him or about him regarding post-war stuff. Uh, 
finding wartime stuff of his is, is fairly difficult. I, I don't know what happened to it. Um, he kept every scrap of paper that ever crossed his desk from post uh, Appomattox onwards. Like I say, there's no shortage of that. But uh, finding his Civil War correspondence, there's bits and pieces of it scattered. There, there's a little bit of it at Duke. Uh, VMI has a lot of his correspondence with, uh, with Francis Smith uh, leading up to the war and from uh, the early, early part of the war. Um, I think the family still has some of it. Um, I've got uh, some partial transcripts that I've gotten from the, uh, from the folks there at uh, Mahone's Tavern there in, in Cortland, because uh, mm -hmm. they're, of course, still in contact. Uh, uh, I, think it's, I think it's Billy Mahone the seventh uh, lives in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. He runs the, uh, uh, the hospital there. And uh, I've, I've met him a couple of times. Um, so I know there's still some of his stuff that, that the family has, but not a lot of, uh, of Civil War stuff. I, his his uh, supply wagon was captured during the Appomattox campaign. And I suspect that that's what happened to a lot of his Civil War letters. They were you know, uh, either burned or, or hauled off as souvenirs by, uh, by Union soldiers. We do have one question. Of course, we in Norfolk, um, one of our big connections to the Confederacy was Walter Heron Taylor, right. who was Lee's um, aide de camp. Do you know if he and Billy Mahone knew each other, if they had any oh, sort yes. of... Yep. Oh, yes, they, they knew each other quite well. Uh, uh, Walter Taylor and his two brothers all worked for the railroad in some way, shape or form uh, okay. prior to the war. And uh, uh, at least Walter, I'm not sure if the other two did after the war or not, but yeah, Taylor, uh, he, uh, Walter Taylor, he came back as uh, I believe the, uh, uh, the treasurer of the railroad for a time after the war. Yeah, he and, he and Mahone knew each other quite well. Um, his, uh, his two brothers, Richard and, uh, and Robert, both served on Mahone's staff at various times during the war. And uh, for the, about the first two weeks of the war the, uh, that uh, the Walter Taylor was not on Lee's staff. He was serving in the 6th Virginia, so he was serving under uh, Mahone's direct command, uh, like I say, for probably not even two weeks uh, there at the beginning of the war before he got reassigned to Lee. Uh, so yeah, uh, Mahone was very close with the, with the Taylor family, um, not, not just during the war, but, uh, but throughout their entire lives. Uh, that, that's something I, I should have mentioned as well. Uh, all three of them were VMI guys. All uh, Walter, Richard, and Robert were all VMI guys. And Mahone was very, very loyal to VMI when he was, uh, especially uh, with the NNP, when he was looking for engineers or other folks uh, to work for the railroad, uh, he gave first crack uh, to VMI grants. And, and I'm, I'm sure Francis Smith was pointing a lot of guys his way as well. But, uh, but no, knowing the Taylors and with all three of them having VMI connections, yeah, he, they, they, were, they were close. I think we see that today. Uh, VMI alumni are terribly, terribly close group, um, even today. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. But Charlie, that was so interesting. That was so much more information than we know about him. And as you said, you know, that was just a big part of his story, but just a part of it. So you get to work on that book. So we can all read more about him and hopefully have you come and, and do a presentation on your book. Um, I will tell everyone else, thank you so much for coming, um, for attending the program this evening. Our next program will be Wednesday, August 10th. We will still be by Zoom. We are, I've gotten lots of questions about this and I'm sure many of you have thought about it if you haven't directly asked. We do hope to go back to in-person programs at the MacArthur Memorial. Um, we're still working on getting, they, they're still working on getting staff, full-time staff trained for evening programs for an attendant to be there with us on the evening program. Um, we're also working with the city of Norfolk to try to get uh, a streaming capability. So we'll be able to do sort of a hybrid program for those want to come in person and those who prefer to attend by Zoom, including those who are out of state, say Raleigh, North Carolina, and can't be there in person. So we are working on that. We do plan to go back to MacArthur. We just can't tell you exactly when. Um, tonight's program has been recorded and will be available on the Norfolk Historical website within the next few days. So you can check it 
uh, watch Charlie's presentation again and also share it with your friends who unfortunately missed it this evening. So you all have a good evening. Charlie, thank you so much again. Hope to see you again um, before too many months go by. Yeah, and get, get to work on that book. <laughs> and will. we will see you all in August on August 10th. Good night, everybody. Good night.